be the lobby sources of power why is the Israel lobby so effective? One reason is the wide open nature of the American political system. The United States has a divided form of government, a well-established tradition of free speech, and a system in which elections are very expensive to run and where campaign contributions are weakly regulated. This environment gives different groups many different ways to gain access or influence policy. Interest groups can direct campaign contributions to favored candidates and try to defeat candidates whose views are suspect. They can also lobby elected representatives and members of the executive branch, and they can try to get their own supporters appointed to key policy-making positions. Moreover, there are numerous ways for interest groups to mold public opinion by cultivating sympathetic journalists, writing books, articles, and op-eds, and working to discredit or marginalize anyone with different views. For a group that is highly motivated and has sufficient resources, there is no shortage of ways to influence public policy. The lobby's effectiveness also reflects the basic dynamics of interest group politics in a pluralistic society. In a democracy, even relatively small groups can exercise considerable influence if they are strongly committed to a particular issue and the rest of the population is largely indifferent. Even if the group's absolute numbers are small, policymakers and especially members of Congress will tend to accommodate them because they can be confident that the rest of the population will not penalize them for doing so. As one U.S. senator put it, when asked why he and his colleagues signed a piece of controversial legislation pushed by the lobby, there is no political advantage in not signing. If you do sign you don't offend anyone, if you don't you might offend some Jews in your state. Disproportionate influence of small but focused interest groups increases even more when opposing groups are weak or non-existent. Because politicians have to accommodate only one set of interests and the public is likely to hear only one side of the story. Whether the issue is farm subsidies or foreign policy, special interest groups often wield political power that far exceeds their absolute numbers in the population. As will become clear in the next chapter, the Israel lobby enjoys a number of advantages in the competition for influence in the United States. American Jews are relatively prosperous and well-educated, and have an admirable philanthropic tradition. They give generously to political parties and have very high rates of political participation. A sizable minority of American Jews is not strongly committed to Israel, but a clear majority is at least somewhat engaged and a significant minority is strongly energized by this issue. When married to the support Israel gets from Christian Zionists, it is a potent base. Equally important is the impressive level of resources and expertise within the major Jewish organizations in the lobby. According to the political scientist Robert Trice, most major Jewish groups are characterized by large memberships, well-trained professional staffs, adequately financed social, welfare and political programs, specialized working groups for particular problems and elaborate internal communications networks. Moreover, the existence of numerous organizations at the local and national level explains the ability of the pro-Israel movement to mobilize rapidly and in a coordinated fashion on a national scale when important foreign policy issues arise. These efforts are facilitated by Israel's generally favorable image in the United States. As former Senator Warren Rudman, RNH, once commented, they have a pretty good product to sell, we shall see. That favorable image is due in good part to the lobby's own efforts to make sure that Israel is portrayed favorably, as well as the broad sense that the United States and Israel are part of a common Judeo-Christian culture and are linked by various informal connections. Finally, the lobby benefits from the absence of effective opposition. As one senator explained, there's no countervailing sentiment. If you vote contrary to the tremendous pressure of APAC, nobody says to you, that's great though Arab Americans are a significant minority, they are neither as wealthy, well-organized, numerous, or politically active as Jewish Americans. As a group, Arab Americans have not been as successful in reaching prominent positions in academia, business, and the media, and they are also less visible in politics. This is partly because the main waves of Arab immigrants shine to the United States occurred relatively recently, and first-generation I migrants are less affluent, less represented in important professions, less familiar with American mores and institutions, less active in politics, and therefore less influential than subsequent generations tend to be. Pro-Arab organizations are also no match for the major groups that make up the Israel lobby. There are a handful of pro-Arab and pro-Palestinian interest groups in the United States. But they are smaller than APAC and other pro-Israel organizations, not nearly as well-funded and nowhere near as effective. According to Mitchell Bard, the former editor of IPAC's Near East Report, from the beginning, the Arab lobby has faced not only a disadvantage in electoral politics, but also in organization. There are several polite oriented groups, 
but many of these are one-man operations with little financial or popular support. U.S. politicians rarely, if ever, complain about pressure from an Arab-American lobby and have little reason to adjust their behavior to accommodate it. As Harry Truman famously remarked, in all of my political experience I don't ever recall the Arab vote swinging a close election, moreover, because Arab Americans come from a variety of countries and backgrounds, and include Christians as well as Muslims, they are unlikely to speak with a unified voice on Middle East issues. Indeed, they sometimes hold sharply opposing views, and whereas many Americans sense a degree of cultural proximity between Israel and the United States, and believe Israelis are like us, Arabs are often seen as part of an alien, or even hostile, civilization. As a result, winning hearts and minds in the United States is an uphill battle for its Arab American citizens in ways that it has not been for American Jews or their Christian allies. Robert Trice's 1981 assessment of Arab American groups remains true today. Their impact on most aspects of U.S. Middle East policy remains negligible. A modest impact of oil neither Arab governments nor the vaunted oil lobby pose a significant counterweight to the Israel lobby. The belief that oil companies and or wealthy oil sheetums exert a powerful influence on U.S. Middle East poll I see is widespread and is reflected in the frequent claim that the war in Iraq in 2003 was a war for oil and for related corporate interests such as Halabatan. Interestingly, this view is advanced by some of Israel's most persistent critics such as Noam Chomsky and Stephen Zunes as well, as by fervent defenders like Martin Peretz or conspiratorial versions of this perspective. Taif suggests that personal and financial connections between the Bush fam Ailey and the House of Saud have shaped U.S. Middle East policy to America's detriment. These various interpretations portray the Israel lobby as just one player among many, and probably not the most important one. There is no question that the United States has a major strategic interest in the energy resources located in the Persian Gulf. Although the United States currently imports more of its energy from Canada, Mexico, and Venezuela than from states in the Middle East. Oil and natural gas are bought and sold in a tightly integrated world market, and thus anything that reduces the overall supply is going to push prices up and hurt the American economy as discussed in Chapter 2. This is why U.S. leaders see the Pashan Gulf as a vital interest and why they have taken steps to preserve a balance of power there and prevent any hostile state from interfering with the flow of oil from that region. This basic fact also explains why the United States has sought to preserve good relations with a number of different countries in the Gulf, despite differing with them on various domestic and foreign policy issues. The importance of Middle East oil led the United States to become a close ally of Saudi Arabia after World War II and is one reason why Washington backed the Shah of Iran for many years. After his regime fell in 1979, this same desire to maintain a local balance of power and to keep the oil flowing convinced the Reagan administration to tilt towards Saddam Hussein's Iraq during the Iran-Iraq War, 1980-88. The United States then intervened to evict Iraq from Kuwait after it seized the Sheikdom in 1990, a policy consistent with the long-standing U.S. policy of preventing any single power from establishing hegemony in the region. A powerful lobby was not needed to encourage these policies, because few questioned the need to keep Persian Gulf oil out of unfriendly hands. Beyond this obvious interest in preserving access to Middle East oil, however, there is little evidence that either wealthy Arab states or a powerful oil lobby has had much impact on the broad thrust of U.S. Middle East policy. After all, if Arab petrodollars or energy companies were driving American policy, one would expect to see the United States distancing itself from Israel and working overtime to get the Palestinians a state of their own. Countries like Saudi Arabia have repeatedly pressed Washington to adopt a more even-handed position toward the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But to let Tiali avail, and even wielding the oil weapon during the 1973 October war had little effect on U.S. support for Israel or on overall American policy in the region. Similarly, if oil companies were driving U.S. policy, one would also have expected Washington to curry favor with big oil producers like Saddam Hussein's Iraq, Muammar Gaddafi's Libya, or the Islamic Republic of Iran, so that U.S. companies could make money helping them develop their energy resources and bringing them to market. Instead, the United States imposed sanctions on all three of these countries, in sharp opposition to what the oil industry wanted. Indeed, as we will show in Part II, in some cases the U.S. government deliberately intervened to thwart business deals that would have benefited U.S. companies. If the oil lobby were as powerful as some critics believe, such actions would not have occurred. Wealthy oil producers such as Saudi Arabia have hired public relations firms and professional lobbyists to enhance their image in the United States and to lobby for specific arms deals, and their efforts have occasionally borne fruit. 
Their most notable achievement was convincing Congress to approve sale of a WAX aircraft to Saudi Arabia in 1982, despite IPAC's strong opposition. This episode is sometimes invoked to demonstrate the Israel lobby's limited influence and the power of the Arab lobby, but the latter's victory in this case was mostly due to a set of unusually favorable conditions. The strategic importance of Saudi oil was obvious. The Soviet Union was seen as a serious military threat to the Gulf at that time, Ronald Reagan was a popular president, and his administration pulled out all the stops to win Congress. Signal approval. Even so, the sale barely squeaked through. The final Senate vote was 52-48 in favor, and Reagan was forced to withdraw several subsequent arms packages to Saudi Arabia and Jordan in the face of renewed op. Position from the lobby and from Congress? One reason why Arab oil producers have only limited influence is their lack of an indigenous base of support in the United States. Because they are forced to rely on professional lobbyists and public relations firms, it is easier for critics to denigrate their representatives as mere agents of a foreign power. IPAC's Tom Dine once dismissed Saudi lobbying efforts by saying, they hire foreign agents like Fred Dutton to do their bidding. Their support is not rooted in American soil. The Israel lobby, by contrast, is a manifestation of the political engagement of a subset of American citizens, and so it's active. ITs are widely and correctly seen as a legitimate form of political activity. Furthermore, because most oil exporting governments depend on large revenues to keep themselves in power, threatening to cut off the supply is not credible, and their leverage is thus reduced. Many of these governments also have sizable investments in Western economies and would suffer considerable losses in the event of a sustained economic downturn. Reducing production would drive prices up and make alternative energy sources more attractive and give the United States and other countries a big incentive to wean themselves from oil dependence once and for all. Because major oil exporters like Saudi Arabia want to keep the industrial powers hooked on oil and gas, they have an obvious disincentive to using what little leverage may be at their disposal. As a result, US dependence on imported energy supplies has not given these countries much influence over US policy. What about energy companies? These corporations do engage in plenty of lobbying activities. But their efforts in recent decades have focused almost entirely on their commercial interests rather than on broader aspects of foreign policy. Specifically, energy companies concentrate on tax policy, government regulation, environmental concerns, access to potential drilling sites, and other practical dimensions of energy policy. For them, foreign poll IC is normally a secondary concern. And according to Robert Trice, their primary goal is to create a political and economic environment in the Middle East that will allow them to maximize profits. As such, the political interests of corporate actors are generally much narrower than those of the pro-Arab groups. This relatively narrow focus is apparent when one examines the website of the American Petroleum Institute, the flagship trade association of the oil industry. Five topics appear under the general heading of policy issues, climate change, exploration production, fuels, taxes and trade, and homeland security. There is no reference to Israel or the Arab-Israeli conflict anywhere on the site, and few references to foreign policy at all. By contrast, Israel and US foreign policy are front and center on the websites of APAC, the ADL, and the Conference of Presidents. As IPAC's Morris Amate noted in the early 1980s, when oil interests and other corporate interests lobby 99% of the time they are acting in what they perceive to be their own self-interest they lobby on tax bills. We very rarely see them lobby eyeing on foreign policy issues. In a sense, we have the field to ourselves. In addition, American corporations appear to be discouraged from trying to influence US Middle East policy by the fear of retaliation from well-organized pro-Israel groups. In 1975, for example, the revelation that Gulf oil had underwritten a number of pro-Arab activities in the United States led to public condemnations by the Conference of Presidents and the Anti-Defamation League. In response, Gulf bought a half-page ad in the New York Times certain it will not have pen again, as Trice notes, a vigilant, sensitive, and reactive pro. Israel lobby is one reason why US corporations have tended to avoid direct participation in domestic political debates on Middle East questions. Some commentators believe that oil and gas companies are driving US policy either to gain lucrative concessions in places like Iraq, or to foment instability that will drive up oil prices and enable them to reap windfall profits. 135 Not only is there little direct evidence of such behavior, but it runs counter to the long-term interests of major energy companies. Energy companies do not like wars in oil-rich regions, sanctions, or regime change the staples of US Middle East policy in recent years because each of them threatens access to oil and gas reserves and thus their ability to make money. 
and such events also encourage Americans to think more seriously about reducing demand for the oil company's main product. Thus, when Vice President Dick Cheney was the president of Halliburton, Inc., a major oil services firm, in the 1990s, he opposed U.S. sanctions on Iran a policy, as discussed in Chapter 10, driven largely by the lobby, and complained that U.S. firms were being cut out of the action by America's sanctions happy policy. Cheney's earlier position suggests that if oil companies controlled Middle East policy, the United States would have pursued a very different agenda in recent years. None of this denies that oil companies, but capitalists that they are, will seek to profit from foreign policy initiatives that they did not encourage. It is not surprising that oil companies want to obtain lucrative concessions in post-Saddam Iraq, just as they would have been happy to do business with Saddam himself. On balance, however, wealthy Arab governments and the oil lobby exert much less influence on U.S. foreign policy than the Israel lobby does. Because oil interests have less need to skew foreign policy in the directions they favor and they do not have the same leverage, writing in the early 1970s. The Columbia University professor and former Assistant Secretary of State Roger Hilsman observed, it is obvious to even the most casual observer, that United States foreign policy in the Middle East, where oil reigns supreme, has been more responsive to the pressures of the American Jewish community and their natural desire to support Israel than it has to American oil interests, in his comparison of the Israel and Arab lobbies. Mitchell Bard acknowledges that although oil companies like Aramco have conducted lobbying campaigns in the past, the effort has had no observable impact on U.S. policy, or as IPAC's former legislative director, Douglas Bloomfield, told BBC News in 2003, APAC has one enormous advantage. It really doesn't have any opposition. Ate the question of dual loyalty this picture of a powerful special interest group, comprised mainly of Amer Eichen Jews and working to move US policy in a pro-Israel direction, is bound to make some people uncomfortable, because it seems to invoke the specter of dual loyalty, which was once a common anti-Semitic canard in older Europe. The charge, in its original incarnation, was that Jews in the diaspora were perpetual aliens who could not assimilate and become good patriots. According to this now discredited argument, Jews were thought to be loyal only to each other. The infamous protocols of the elders of Zion, a czarist for Jerry that was exposed and discredited long ago, claimed that Jews operate as a fifth column in the countries where they live, working for a committee of Jewish elders who are secretly plotting to dominate the world. In this earlier, anti-Semitic incarnation, dual loyalty was in fact a miss. Omer as the charge implied that Jews were loyal only to each other and felt no genuine loyalty to their home countries. Today, however, both scholars and commentators use the term in a neutral and non-pejorative fashion to describe the widespread circumstance where individuals feel genuine attachments, or loyalties, to more than one country. Thus, in his recent comparison of different ethnic diasporas, the Israeli political scientist Gabriel Sheffer distinguishes among total, dual, and divided loyalty, and notes that all three responses occur when members of a particular ethnic, national, or religious group are scattered across different states. As discussed below, other thoughtful Jewish Americans have used dual loyalty to describe their own attitudes and experiences, but their use of the term is very different from its past employment as an anti-Semitic slander. Any notion that Jewish Americans are disloyal citizens is wrong. We fully agree with Malcolm Honlein, who directs the Conference of Presidents, that it is safe to say that American Jews are among the most patriotic and loyal of American citizens as we have made clear. Those who lobby on his rail's behalf are acting in ways that are consistent with long-standing political traditions. Indeed, political life in the United States has long proceeded from the assumption that all individuals have a variety of attachments and loyalties to country, religion, family, employer just to name a few, and that American citizens will create formal and informal associations that reflect those loyalties and interests. Consider, for example, a 2006 Pew Global Attitude survey of Christians in 13 countries in which 42% of the U.S. respondents saw themselves as Christians first and Americans second. These different attachments, which sometimes include an affinity for a foreign country, may reflect ancestry, religious affiliation, personal experience, such as overseas study, or a Peace Corps assignment, or any number of other sources. It is legitimate for U.S. citizens to express such attachments and affinities in political life. This is in fact what democratic theory implies that they should do. As we have noted, it is even permissible for Americans to hold dual citizenship and to serve in foreign armies, including the IDF, and some have done so. Americans who work to influence U.S. foreign policy in ways that benefit Israel almost always believe that the policies they favor will benefit the United States as well. His former APAC executive director Tom Dine told one interviewer, 
I came to this job thinking American foreign policy and how to strengthen America's position in the world. At the same time, thought a lot about Israel because I'm Jewish more, to the point Theodore Manor, former head of the Conference of Presidents said, in 2001 that leading American Jews really feel very deeply that American interests and Israeli interests are one and the same. While there is no question that this perspective is widely and deeply held, there is a problem with it. No two countries will always have the same interests. It is just not the way international politics works. There have been instances in the past, and there will be more in the future, where US and Israeli interests were at odds. For example, it made good strategic sense for Israel to acquire nuclear weapons in the 1960s, but it was not in America's interest to have Israel go nuclear, nor is it in the US national interest when Israel kills or wounds innocent Palestinian civilians, even if only unintentionally, and especially not when it uses American-made weapons to do it. One sees a similar divergence of interests in Israel's decision to invade Lebanon in 1982, and in its recent opposition to US plans to sell advanced weaponry to Saudi Arabia and other Persian Gulf states nonetheless. Many of Israel's supporters find it hard to acknowledge that Jerusalem and Washington could have fundamentally different interests. In other words, they fully accept the strategic and moral rationales that we laid out and refuted in chapters 2 and 3, and they work hard to convince policy makers of their continued validity. They may also hold to these views because humans are usually uncomfortable when important values conflict. Even when US and Israeli interests are clearly at odds, some of Israel's American backers will find it difficult to acknowledge that a significant treaty off exists. There are, however, thoughtful Jewish Americans, including some prominent policymakers, who openly acknowledge that conflicts can and do arise among their Jewish identities, their understandable interest in Israel's well-being, and their genuine loyalty to the United States. To his credit, Henry Kissinger dealt forthrightly with this issue in his memoirs, writing that though not practicing my religion, I could never forget that 13 members of my family had died in Nazi concentration camps. Most Israeli leaders were personal friends, and yet, I had to subordinate my emotional preferences to my perception of the national interest. It was not always easy, occasionally it proved painful, Kissinger acknowledges, what many would deny, tensions are bound to arise whenever Americans have strong affinities for other countries. No matter what the origins of those attachments and no matter how consistently they resolve them on behalf of their homeland. Or as one of Bill Clinton's Middle East advisors admitted anonymously, we act in America's interest, but through a prism. Another veteran Jewish American diplomat expressed a similar feeling by saying, I thank God that I'm not working in Middle East affairs or at the UN, where you might have to vote to condemn the Israeli, for these statements are in no sense confessions of disloyalty. On the contrary, they are admirably honest reflections on the multiple loyalties that all human beings feel and that sometimes come into conflict. The journalist Eric Alterman offered an equally candid acknowledgement in 2003, noting that his own dual loyalties were drilled into me by my parents, my grandparents, my Hebrew school teachers and my rabbis, not to mention Israeli teen, tour leaders and APAC college representatives, but instead of pretending that potential trade-offs will never arise, Alterman recognizes that we ought to be honest enough to at least imagine a hypothetical clash between American and Israeli interests. Here, I feel pretty lonely admitting that, every once in a while, I'm going to go with what's best for Israel, yet Alterman is not in fact alone. Consider the remarks of Stephen Steinleit, former director of national affairs at the American Jewish Committee. After recounting his own upbringing in America as a Jewish nationalist, even a quasi-separatist, Steinleit remarks, the process of my nationalist training was to inculcate the belief that the primary division of the world was between us and them. Of course we saluted the American and Canadian flags and sang those anthems, usually with real feeling. But it was clear where our primary loyalty was meant to reside. I'm also familiar with the classic well, honed answer to this tension any time this is cited Israel, and Amer Ica are democracies they, share values they, have common strategic interests. Loyalty to one cannot conceivably involve disloyalty to the other, etc., etc. All of which begs huge questions, and while it may be true in practice most of the time, it is by no means an absolute construct, devoid of all sort of potential exceptions. We have no less difficult a balancing act between group loyalty and a wider sense of belonging to America. That America has largely tolerated this dual loyalty, we get a free pass, I suspect, largely over Christian guilt about the Holocaust makes it no less a reality when it is important to emphasize that this phenomenon is not confined to Jewish Americans. Rather, 
Such tensions are an inevitable feature of a melting pot society that has drawn its citizens from all over the world. It is equally important to note that most American Jews would surely reject any suggestion that they would place Israel's interests ahead of America's if an obvious conflict arose between them. Jews and non-Jews who believe that the United States should continue to give Israel strong and unconditional support have every right to advocate their positions, and it is wrong to question their loyalty when they do. Yet it is equally legitimate for critics to point out that organizations like APAC are not neutral, or that the individuals who run APAC, the ADL, the Conference of Presidents, and similar organizations are motivated by an attach meant to Israel that is bound to shape their thinking about many foreign policy issues. Why else would Malcolm Honing describe his job as follows? I devote myself to the security of the Jewish state. Deg Deg, or why does John Hagee of Kufi address the potential conflict between his support for Israeli settlements and official U.S. opposition to them by saying that the law of God transcends the laws of the United States government and the U.S. State Department? If he were not inspired by a strong attachment to Israel, why would Lenny Ben David, the former director of information and research at APAC, agree to serve as Israel's deputy chief of mission in Washington from 1997 to 2000? It is equally legitimate to question whether the policies advocated by these individuals and the organizations they represent are in the U.S. national interest. Just as it is legitimate to question the impact of other special interest lobbies on other elements of U.S. domestic or foreign policy, their patriotism can be above reproach. But their advice might be fostering policies that are wreaking havoc in a region of considerable strategic importance to the United States and indeed to the rest of the world. To question the soundness of that advice has nothing to do with the older, discredited use of dual loyalty to imply that Jews were unpatriotic. Conclusion The Israel lobby is the antithesis of a cabal or conspiracy. It operates out in the open and proudly advertises its own clout. In its basic operations, the Israel lobby is no different from interest groups like the farm lobby, steel and textile workers, and a host of ethnic lobbies, although the groups and in the vigils who comprise the Israel lobby are in an unusually favorable position to influence U.S. foreign policy. What sets it apart, in short, is its extraordinary effectiveness. In the next two chapters, we examine the strategies it employs to achieve its goals.